Hello. Welcome back to Bellearn. So this is our last uh, keynote session for the day. We're going to have our Sergey Levine, who's uh, with uh, Berkeley and Google Brain. Sergey is uh, someone who would like in the future machines to uh, experiment with the word and learn and discover how to uh, solve some tasks. And he's uh, working on different things uh, to achieve that, including you know some uh, robots. Um, uh, reinforcement learning. Today is going to talk about a uh, different topic, which is like meta learning. Meta learning is a technique to basically learn to learn, and there's apparently something wrong with it. But we're also going to learn how to. We're going to fix it. So, without further ado, please welcome Sergey. Thank you for the introduction. Um, right, so uh, in kind of my, my day job, my students and I, we work on deep learning and reinforcement learning and robotics. And of course, whenever I give one of these talks, uh, something that's quite nice to do is to show some cool videos of robots. So I'll actually begin with cool videos of robots, but then I'll move on to a slightly different topic that's still relevant to this, but, that, but this is the main thing I wanted to focus on. So I uh, started working on robotics and, and reinforcement learning maybe about uh, five, six years ago. And about four years ago, we did some work on end-to-end uh, -end deep reinforcement learning for robotics, where we tried to see if we could get a robot to learn various manipulation skills directly from pixels to uh, motor torques. And we got some fairly decent results. So this is a robot. This is a PR2 robot, and it's trying to perform this little uh, block insertion puzzle. In the corner there, you can see what the robot is seeing from its camera, and it's trying to do this skill directly from pixels to motor torques. And it could do a few things. It could put some caps on bottles, things like that. Um, so at, you know, at the time, these results were quite nice, but the particular skills that you're seeing, they're kind of instance-level skills. So the robot hasn't really learned to put caps on bottles. It learned to put that particular cap on that particular bottle. So after this uh, project, we thought, well, really the big strength of deep learning should be in generalization. Can we get robotic skills that can be learned end-to-end, -end, but that also generalize to new objects, new scenes that they haven't seen before? So one of the ways we thought about doing this, this is some work that was done uh, at Google, uh, was to see if we can parallelize learning across multiple robots. So, so we thought, well, maybe if we get four robots to all work together to learn how to open doors, perhaps then they could generalize a little bit to slightly different doors that they hadn't seen before. And that worked a little bit, but of course, in deep learning, we achieve generalization by training on very large amounts of data, not just on four instances. So then we thought, well, maybe what we need is we need denser supervision. Perhaps instead of learning individual tasks, we can learn something more basic about the world, like how to predict what will happen next. So then we did some work on uh, learning to predict the future, essentially learning video prediction, and then using these video prediction models to perform uh, tasks. And these tasks would then generalize to new objects that weren't seen before by learning the common patterns inherent in physics. So what you're seeing uh, in the animations here are the predictions made by the model for different potential actions that this robotic arm could take. So then a user could, for example, click on the point indicated in red, click on the point indicated in green, and say, well, I want this stapler to be moved from this location to this other one. The robot would imagine how it might do this, so that what you're seeing there is the prediction of the robot moving the stapler, and then go and execute that. So that also worked to some degree. Of course, the, the tasks were a bit simpler because it's trying to generalize to a much broader range of situations. Uh, more recently at Google, we tried to scale this up even more. We thought, well, OK, if we just pick a particular task, a task that's relevant to lots of robotic applications like grasping, can we get really good generalization just by scaling this thing up massively? So we thought, well, we'll get robots to learn to grasp from seeing thousands of different objects running, not for days or weeks, but actually for several months. And then we'll get generalization uh, to objects that haven't been seen before with a very high degree of proficiency. So uh, we did that. This is a, a, an illustration of the training process. And if you learn a policy this way, and then you show it objects that it hasn't seen before, so it has never seen this clamp before, it'll figure out how to pick it up. And even when the, the nefarious human goes and perturbs it, the robot can still recover and pick up the object. So there's some generalization happening, the kind of generalization that we really would like to see from deep models. But there is kind of a dark side to the story. So I started off showing these kind of instance-level skills. And these instance-level skills could be learned in about four hours each, which is pretty reasonable. Like, you, you can uh, wait for a robot to learn a skill, and then it'll be able to do something. I showed how we can get generalization, but the generalization occurs after a much larger training period, about four weeks of training. So there's a big cost that we pay to making this happen. And this feels a little strange, because a person can learn a new task. Like, they can learn to use a new tool, for example, to assemble some piece of furniture in just minutes, 
So people can learn new skills extremely quickly. Whereas our robots seem to be taking a while, and if we want those robots to generalize, they take a really long while. So how is it that people can do this? Well, a very reasonable hypothesis is that people aren't actually learning all these things entirely from scratch. So even though you can learn to use a new tool to assemble a new piece of furniture, you have this rich prior knowledge about how the world works. So we never learn from scratch, and maybe we can get our machines to also not have to learn from scratch. Maybe we can get them to distill prior knowledge from other tasks that they've learned in the past. So then the question we have to ask is, well, what should we transfer from prior tasks? Perhaps we should transfer representations. Perhaps we should transfer some kind of uh, feature representation of the world. Maybe we should transfer a model. Perhaps we can learn how to predict physics in one set of tasks and then use that in another set. But maybe we can actually optimize for exactly the thing that we really want. The thing that we really want is not features or models. What we want is to be able to learn new things quickly. So maybe we can explicitly optimize models such that they can learn new things more quickly. And this is essentially the idea behind meta-learning or few-shot learning. And that's actually what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about meta-learning algorithms, and I'm going to talk about them in the context of both reinforcement learning and supervised learning problems. So although for me, the thing that really motivates me to work on this stuff is that I want robots to be able to learn new skills very efficiently, I think some of the ideas that come out of this can also be broadly useful for supervised learning, like computer vision, speech recognition, and so on. So what I'm going to talk about is how we can learn to learn. I'm going to first discuss the meta-learning or few-shot learning problem statement, just to set up the problem in a formal way that we can work with. And then I'm going to describe a simple model agnostic method for meta-learning that we developed at UC Berkeley about a year ago that I think actually simplifies uh, meta-learning uh, in, in a really interesting way and makes it actually quite practical to apply to a wide range of problems. Then I'm going to talk about a problem that starts to crop up once you start doing few-shot learning, which doesn't happen so often when you're dealing with large data sets, which is the problem of ambiguity. If you have to learn from a very small number of examples or a small number of trials, there can be a lot of ambiguity about how to do something, and actually Bayesian methods that model that ambiguity can become very useful. So I'll discuss that a little bit. And then the last topic that I'm going to discuss, which I think is actually the most interesting and the most relevant, is how to do meta-learning without requiring access to lots of human-designed tasks. And this is, I think, very important because it addresses one of the major shortcomings of current meta-learning methods, which is the need to have large data sets of tasks. So regular deep learning requires large data sets of labeled data. Meta-learning requires large data sets of tasks, which is potentially even more onerous to obtain. So I'm going to discuss some initial work we've done to try to begin addressing that challenge. But let's begin with a problem statement. So this slide is, is actually borrowed from a paper by Ravi and La Rochelle, where they have this really excellent illustration of the few-shot learning problem in its kind of modern incarnation in deep learning. Essentially, if you want to learn how to learn, what you can do is you can turn this meta-learning problem into a regular standard learning problem, where instead of data points, you have tasks. So in standard learning, you have tasks, uh, you, you have data points, which have inputs and corresponding outputs. In meta-learning or few-shot learning, you can reformulate it as saying, well, now our data points are entire tasks, which themselves consist of training set and, and test set. So then we have a meta-training set, which itself consists of lots of little training sets and lots of little test sets. And your model now is going to be trained to ingest each of those training sets and do well on its corresponding test set. So for example, you'll train a model so that it reads in that picture of a bird, mushroom, dog, person, and piano, and then does a good job of classifying, let's say, dogs and pianos in the test set. And then at meta test time, what you can do is you can give this model a little training set with new classes that it has never seen before. So you can show it the cat, the dog, and the lion, even though it has never seen cats and dogs and lions, because it has learned how to ingest these small training sets, it will do well at then classifying lions uh, in new situations. So that's the basic idea. And we can make this idea a little bit more formal by writing down some equations to represent it in symbols. So if we have a regular supervised learning problem, we can very simply say that the supervised learning problem is that you have some input x, you have some output y, and you'd like to learn a function f of x that predicts y. The corresponding few-shot learning problem can be formalized as uh, learning a function f that takes in a, a little training set d train, which might be maybe five images with their labels, and a test input x, and predicts the test output y. So it's learning a function, just like in supervised learning. Now that function just takes that training set as input. So 
Now, of course, the question we have to ask is, well, how do we build a function like that? How do we build a function that can read in an entire training set? And this is where actually a lot of the research, the recent research in meta learning and few shot learning has come in, designing neural network architectures that can read in entire training sets. There are many options. A very simple one is to just use some kind of sequence model, like a recurrent neural network that reads in the individual input-output tuples one by one, and then reads in the the test input, and then tries to predict the test output. It's a very simple design, and many uh, methods have been proposed in the literature that essentially iterate on this design by proposing better architectures for these types of models. So there's quite a bit of research on this, on things like memory augmented networks, a kind of a non-parametric method as proposed in the matching networks paper, and a kind of clustering method in the prototypical networks work, and many, many others. So this is not by any means a complete list. But the general theme in these works is to think about the problem of meta-learning from the standpoint of neural network architecture design. Can we design a neural network architecture that can read in an entire training set? But if we motivated this work by saying our goal is to learn how to learn, then we can start asking some questions. We can say, well, if doing this meta-learning thing learned a learning procedure, what is that learning procedure that has been learned? What does it do? Does it converge? What happens if we give it more data? So we can start asking these questions. Maybe the first question we want to ask is, well, where is that learning procedure? Where does it live? In the RNN case, it lives in the weights of the RNN. So essentially, the RNN implements a learning procedure in the way it ingests that training set. And then we can start asking questions, the kind of questions that we would ask about any learning algorithm. We can ask, does it converge? Uh, well, the answer is that it kind of does, because it's an RNN, and you run it forward, and then you get some uh, hidden state uh, weights. So it kind of does converge. Um, what does it converge to? Well, we kind of don't know, because it'll produce some hidden state, it'll produce some answer, and if it has been trained successfully, it'll produce the right answer. Uh, but if it produces the wrong answer, then what can we do? Well, with a regular learning algorithm, we know what we can do. We can give it more data, we can train it for longer, and it'll become better. Uh, but with, uh, with an approach that relies entirely on training the algorithm inside the weights of the RNN, who knows? Perhaps if it was trained to ingest always five images, if you give it five more images, there's no reason that it would become actually better. So all these thorny issues make it a little tricky to apply these kinds of meta-learning methods in practice when you want to use kind of your, your regular intuition about learning algorithms. So what I'm going to discuss uh, in the first technical part of this talk is a method that we developed that can perform meta-learning, but also allows us to get a little bit more understanding about what the learned uh, learning procedure is actually doing. And we call this method model agnostic meta-learning because it can be applied to any neural network architecture. Instead of designing new architectures, it's based around designing a general purpose algorithm that can go with any architecture. So the way that we went about thinking about, about this problem is that we said, well, let's step back a little bit and think about what else we can do if we have a small training set. Maybe let's not worry about this meta-learning thing. If you just have a small training set, let's say in computer vision, what can you do? Well, one really good thing to do is to take another really big data set, like ImageNet, train a big ConvNet on that data set, pull out the features from that ConvNet, and then use those features uh, and, le and learn how to classify your, your new uh, data set on top of those features. And that can work really well. This is sometimes called fine-tuning. It works very well, actually. So is this kind of pre-training followed by fine-tuning a type of meta-learning? Because essentially, you're using your past task classifying ImageNet to get some, something that helps you solve new tasks with a small number of data points. So perhaps it is a kind of meta-learning. The trouble is that pre-training and fine-tuning isn't explicitly optimizing for your ability to fine-tune later. When you pre-train the network, you're just trying to do well in ImageNet. You're not trying to optimize that network so that it does well when it fine-tunes. So perhaps we can take inspiration from pre-training and fine-tuning, but explicitly optimize our model so that it does well when it's fine-tuned. And that's the intuition behind this approach. So, uh, and this is work that was uh, uh, led in large part by Chelsea Finn. So the general recipe is going to be based on the same principle. We have our meta training set, which has little training sets that I'm going to call detrain, and little test sets that I'm going to call detest. And we know that when we adapt to a new task, we're going to be fine tuning. So fine tuning means we're going to compute the gradient with respect to our parameters on detrain, and we're going to use that gradient to update our parameters. So we're going to do gradient descent. That's, that's what fine tuning is. And this is the equation for one step of gradient descent on our loss function on D-train. Uh, in reality, you can take more than one gradient step here. And for our practical implementation of model agnostic meta-learning, we would use about four to 10 steps, so a small number of gradient steps. 
Now, our goal during meta training is not to actually train on individual uh, training sets. It's to train our model so that this procedure does well on the corresponding test set. So we're not going to actually be taking these gradient steps and updating our model parameters. We're going to be taking these gradient steps and then computing our loss function on the test set after the gradient step. And that's what we're going to optimize. So we're going to optimize the performance of our model after it has been updated with gradient descent on each of the individual training sets. And we're going to optimize performance with respect to the corresponding test set. So this is the loss that we want to optimize. And then we can compute its gradient. So this is the meta loss. We take its gradient. That's the meta gradient. And we use that to update our model. So we can get a little bit of a graphical intuition for what this does from this picture. So if you imagine the thick curved line theta, that's the path through parameter space during meta training. And the individual arrows show the gradients for, in this case, each of three tasks. And our goal is to move that parameter uh, vector through the parameter space to a location where the optimal parameters for each of the tasks are one gradient step away. So we start uh, somewhere far away so that the individual gradient updates might not necessarily get us to a good place. And we want to end up somewhere where individual gradient updates improve our model as much as possible on the respective tasks. The nice thing about this procedure is that, of course, you can apply it for any neural network architecture. So it doesn't make any assumptions about the neural network architecture or even about the form of that loss, so long as you can compute the gradients, which means that you can use this for supervised learning or reinforcement learning. OK. So that's kind of the, the outline of the method. But now we can ask, well, what is this method really doing? One way to look at this is that it's training your model so that fine tuning works well. But we can also cast it back into the mold of meta learning that we discussed before. So before, we talked about how supervised learning learns a function f of x that gives you y. Supervised meta learning learns a function f of d train comma x that gives you y. It turns out that model agnostic meta learning just learns a different form of that same function. So you can say that. Model agnostic meta learning learns this thing called F mammal, and it just has a very particular form. The form of, of F mammal will be to use your neural network parameters after the update, which I'm going to denote here with theta prime, and evaluate them on the test input x. And theta prime is simply given by theta minus your step size times the average gradient over the training points in your D train. So even though it has the structure of gradient descent built into it, one way you can look at it is just as a very special form of that function f. And what that means, of course, is that you can implement it as just another computation graph using your standard kind of uh, uh, automatic differentiation software like TensorFlow or PyTorch and so on. Now, this way of looking at it kind of makes it seem the same as, as everything else. But of course, there is a difference. And, and the difference comes up when we start thinking about what the learned learning procedure really does. So as I discussed before, if you have uh, an, uh, a general kind of opaque learning procedure, you might not know whether it will improve with more data or anything like that. With model agnostic meta learning, the procedure is that you, you put in your parameters, you put in your detrain, update with gradient descent, and then you get your theta prime. And you can ask the same question. You can say, does it converge? The answer is uh, it converges to a local optimum the same way that gradient descent does. What does it converge to? The local optimum. And if, it does, if it's not good enough, what you can do is you can add more data. So if your D-train was too small, you're not happy with your accuracy, you can add more data points. And kind of in the worst case, it reverts to gradient descent. Now, we can also ask at this point, OK, that, that's kind of nice, but did, did, did that cost us anything? We know that RNNs are very powerful. RNNs can implement any program. Gradient descent seems like maybe it's less powerful. Did, did we actually lose some kind of representational power uh, over this? So we studied this question a little bit uh, in a paper in iClear uh, 2018. And what we try to understand is, does this procedure retain universality? So what I mean by universality here is, can this procedure learn any learning algorithm? And for the purpose of this discussion, what I mean by a learning algorithm is, can it learn any function f of d train comma x? It's actually pretty clear that the giant RNN can actually learn any function uh, of d train comma x if it's big enough, because it's a universal function approximator. It's a lot less obvious that model agnostic meta learning can do this. It turns out there is actually a construction by which you can show that if you have a deep enough and wide enough neural network, then model agnostic meta learning can, in fact, represent any function of d train and x. This is a little bit non trivial because it's saying that uh, gradient descent can essentially, uh, followed by this evaluation, can implement any learning procedure. 
it has a few limitations. One of the limitations is that it, the function has to be permutation invariant because you're just averaging together the gradients, so you don't know about the ordering of the data points. But that seems like a reasonable assumption. The more problematic assumption is that, in theory, it requires an extremely deep neural network, uh, which is perhaps a little problematic. But if it's deep enough, then it should be universal. So now let me show you some examples of model agnostic meta learning in action. What I'm going to show you is an example for a reinforcement learning problem. So the reinforcement learning problem will be to get this uh, little quadrupedal robot to run in different directions. During meta training, we train it with tasks that ask it to run in different directions. And during meta testing, we're going to give it a particular direction, give it uh, a few trials and a reward for that, and then ask it to update its policy. So what I'm going to show you first is the policy that is represented by MAML after meta training, but before adaptation. So this is the pre-update policy. This policy isn't trying to do any particular task, but it's kind of ready to adapt. And what you see when you run this policy is actually very natural. You see that the robot kind of runs in place. It's not running in any particular direction, but it's kind of ready to go. And then if you give it one iteration with a reward function for running forward, then it actually immediately figures out how to run forward. And if you give it one iteration with a reward function for running backward, then it figures out how to run backward. So this is using a policy gradient version of MAML. Uh, and of course, there's quite a bit of related work in the meta-learning literature that also makes use of gradient descent somewhere in the meta-learning procedure, including for things like optimizing hyperparameters, trying to learn optimization algorithms, uh, and also combining gradient computations with RNNs to do better meta-learning. So there's quite a bit of related work and many, many others. This is not a complete list. But the nice thing about model agnostic meta-learning is that because it, is, uh, it can be used with any neural network architecture and any loss function, uh, it can actually be improved over time as our network architectures get better and better. So there's been quite a bit of follow-up work. And one of the things we noticed is that uh, the results for MAML on standard few-shot learning benchmarks actually keep getting better and better. So we perhaps didn't do a very good job of designing our architectures when we first did this research. We actually just borrowed somebody else's architecture. And on a very popular benchmark called MiniImageNet, five-shot, five-way classification, we got an accuracy of 63.11%, which at the time we thought was pretty good. Um, but it turns out that later on, with improvements to things like architecture design, there have been quite a few improvements in actually the performance of the same model agnostic meta learning algorithm. The latest, the one that I have cited at the bottom by Kim et al, actually uses uh, architecture search, kind of an auto ML style approach, to optimize over architectures and improves on our result by about uh, 13%, which is actually quite nice. OK, uh, so that was a, a discussion of how we can build kind of a, a simpler model agnostic meta learning procedure. But there are still quite a few challenges. And one challenge I want to talk about next is the challenge of ambiguity. So it, when we were doing uh, deep learning on large data sets, we often don't worry very much about ambiguity, because when we have a huge amount of labeled data, that pretty much resolves the task to the point where we can figure out what it is. But when we have a very small training set, there might be a lot of ambiguity there. So what I'm going to tell you here is the faces in the left column are going to be the positives. The faces in the right column are the negatives, so it's class 1 and class 2. And the task here involves recognizing whether the face has the right two attributes. And just so happens that here, all the positives have three attributes. They're all smiling, wearing hats, and young. And all the ones on the right do not have any of these attributes. So if I show you a new face that is smiling and wearing a hat but not young, you actually can't classify this correctly because you don't actually know what the task is. You don't know whether young matters or not because all the faces on the left were young, all the ones on the right weren't. But there's three attributes, and you know the task only involves two of them. So there are many possible hypotheses here. So can we, instead of uh, adapting and getting one classifier, adapt and get a distribution over classifiers so that we can resolve ambiguity? Because in the few-shot learning case, this can be especially important. It can be important, for example, for learning to do active learning, because if you sample these different classifiers and you see that they're all disagreeing, perhaps you need to uh, ask for more data. It can be important for safety-critical few-shot learning situations, like medical imaging. If you're getting a lot of ambiguity between your classifiers, that's a good sign that something might be wrong, and maybe you need to intervene. And it can also be important for learning exploration in reinforcement learning, where the ambiguity can give you a cue about how to explore. So uh, the goal in this next project is figuring out how to sample classifiers. So meta-train your model so that it can not only adapt quickly, but also generate multiple hypotheses for ambiguous situations, building on the same basic principle of model agnostic meta-learning. So the intuition behind how this method works is that we're going to try to learn a prior over the model parameters 
so that sampling a new classifier simply corresponds to randomly perturbing the parameters and then running gradient descent. So the intuition is that if I have this kind of ambiguous task, I would like to choose my model parameters so that the energy landscape during adaptation has some different local optimum. Maybe it has one local optimum for the classifier for smiling and hat, and one local optimum for smiling and young, and the parameters start off perched on a peak in between these local optima. So that when you give them a random push with, by adding some Ga Gaussian noise, they'll fall into one or the other basin of attraction, at which point running gradient descent will actually give you one or the other hypothesis. So if you repeat this process multiple times, applying a random push and then running gradient descent, you'll sample different hypotheses, will, which will give you different possible explanations for your data. So this was work that was done by Chelsea Finn and Kelvin Shu. Uh, and the idea here was to formulate model agnostic meta learning as a probabilistic graphical model, where we have a prior over parameters theta, and then for each task, we have task-specific parameters phi i, which are given by this procedure where you add noise and then run gradient descent. And of course, each task has training inputs x train and y train, and test inputs x test and y test. So we have a prior over theta, which we're going to represent as a Gaussian with a diagonal covariance. So that's very simple. It's just a parameter vector and a variance on each parameter vector, very similar uh, to conventional Bayesian neural networks. We have a distribution p phi given theta, which corresponds to adding noise and running gradient descent. And the particular distribution has a somewhat complicated form in this case, uh, but we can still train it. And then we have likelihoods for the training and tests. So our goal is to sample phi from p phi given x train, y train, and x test. Phi is independent of x test if y test is unknown, so we can just cross that out. And then we just have to figure out how to perform this inference problem. And it turns out that we can train this model in such a way that performing inference simply corresponds uh, to giving this, uh, this Gaussian kick uh, with random noise and then running gradient descent. The training procedure for this is somewhat involved, so for that I'm going to refer you to the paper, but it basically consists of combining some approximations for map inference with amortized variational inference, where you actually use a recognition network where the mean is actually parameterized by the gradient. So that's how gradient descent actually works its way into this. So for those details, I would encourage you to check out the paper. But let's see some results. So we call this, this algorithm platypus, which stands for probabilistic latent model for incorporating priors on uncertainty in few-shot learning. Uh, and it's, it's an animal that is a type of mammal, I guess. Um, and uh, here are some examples on a toy task, just to understand how this method works. So this toy task is, a, is an ambiguous regression problem. So the uh, purple triangles represent the data points. And the data can consist of either straight lines or sinusoids which means that if the uh, triangles are evenly spaced apart, there's actually ambiguity as to whether the underlying function is a sinusoid or a straight line. And you can see that, especially in the example in the middle, uh, the sampled uh, explanations, which are the dotted lines, sometimes end up being straight lines and sometimes end up being sinusoids. So the model is actually capturing ambiguity to some degree. We can also construct an ambiguous classification problem. So here we have classification from a single example. Uh, the, the data points are points in 2D, and the decision boundaries during meta-training are always circular decision boundaries. And you can see that what platypus samples actually correspond to kind of random circles that are all centered at the training point. Of course, we can apply this to a more complex task, so we can go to the ambiguous uh, face classification example we, show, we showed before, where during meta-training, the positives and negatives always either have or lack exactly two attributes. And then we can intentionally construct ambiguous problems that do not have a single explanation by giving the, pos the positives three attributes and withholding all three of those attributes from the negatives. So on this, we can do a quantitative evaluation and compare platypus to methods that do not explicitly train for the ability to sample explanations, uh, in this case, mammal and then mammal with injected noise without meta-training for that noise. All the methods do fairly well in terms of accuracy, but the second column shows coverage. Coverage refers to how many of the three hypotheses in these ambiguous situations actually end up being sampled when you run this procedure multiple times. And what you can see is that adding noise gets you to sample more hypotheses, but at a big cost in accuracy, whereas platypus retains the accuracy, but also covers all three hypotheses. All right, so in the last part of my talk, I'm going to discuss uh, the last problem which I think is actually the most important. So I, uh, I'd like to uh, spend a bit of time on this in the end. So far, I talked about what we can do with meta-learning. We can handle ambiguity. We can do reinforcement learning and so on. But I didn't really tell you about the, the really big problem, at least what I think is the really big problem. And the, what I think is the really big problem is meta-overfitting. 
So we've all heard about overfitting. If you don't have enough data, then uh, you can overfit to your data and not generalize. Well, meta-learning is not immune to that problem. And in meta-learning, you get meta-overfitting, which means that you can fail to generalize to new tasks. So meta-learning requires somebody to design a task distribution. It requires somebody to give your algorithm many different tasks to use for meta-training. So when I showed the example of the uh, quadrupedal robot running around, someone had to manually specify that during meta-training, it should learn to run in all these different directions. And of course, if, if you specify enough tasks, then you get this nice behavior where it can adapt in one step and all that. But when there are too few meta-training tasks, we can meta-overfit and fail to generalize. And specifying task distributions is actually very hard. It's a very manual process. It's a very manual process for supervised learning. It's an even more painful manual process for reinforcement learning, where specifying those tasks involves manually crafting reward functions. So perhaps a somewhat pessimistic view of things is that when we switch to doing meta-learning, we simply trade it off the difficulty of designing fast algorithms for the difficulty of designing good task distributions. So can we propose tasks automatically? Can we automate this stage, which right now requires quite a bit of manual task design? And that's what I'm going to discuss in the last part of this talk. I don't think, as a, uh, just, just as a prelude, I don't think we've solved this problem, but I think that some of the things that I'll discuss are potentially for uh, early steps in that direction. So the first work I'm going to dis discuss specifically tries to aim at addressing this challenge in the context of meta-reinforcement learning. And this is work that was uh, done by Abhishek Gupta, Benjamin Eisenbach, and Chelsea Finn. So the recipe for unsupervised meta-reinforcement learning will be the following. You're going to get access to an environment without any reward functions. And your agent can interact with that environment as much as it wants, but it's not given any particular goals. So what it has to do is it has to invent its own goals that it can achieve, practice those goals with a meta-learning algorithm so that it can meta-learn a fast RL procedure, and then it will be given a human-specified task at meta-test time and has to achieve that task as fast as possible. So then, of course, the big question we have to ask is, well, how do we generate these task proposals? So for meta-learning, we're going to use the familiar algorithms that I've already discussed, so the big challenge in proposing those tasks. And somewhat surprisingly, it turns out that actually very simple task proposal methods can still uh, provide considerable benefit. So the simplest task proposal technique that we actually experimented with was to actually take a neural network as a classifier, initialize its weights randomly, don't train it at all, and then have the reward function be, uh, for each task, maximize the probability of a corresponding label. So if you have 50 labels in your classifier, label 1 is task 1, label 2 is task 2, label 3 is task 3, etc. So the reward function for the agent is to maximize the log probability of a given label, given the state. I should say this is not the same as having random policies, because the learner still has to actually figure out which states to go to and how to get there in order to maximize the, the probabilities of those labels. So you can think of this as placing random cuts through the state space and asking the policy for each task to go to the, to the, uh, the corresponding half space. We can be a little bit smarter, too. So uh, the random cuts actually does work. But uh, we can get a method that works better by actually training that classifier instead of just initializing it randomly. So this is uh, something that we call diversity-driven proposals based on a paper called Diversity is All You Need, by, uh, uh, led by Benjamin Eisenbach. So the idea here was that we're going to have the, the same discriminator, the same classifier that looks at the state and predicts a label. But now, the classifier will actually collude with the policy to try to make the states that the policy goes into as discriminable from each other as possible. So the policy will visit states which are discriminable, meaning that they have a high probability of the corresponding class. And the classifier will then be retrained to collaborate with the policy to actually classify the states correctly. So the classifier and the policy will co-evolve to separate the state space into easily identifiable regions. So this can get you better performance than just random classifiers, but the form of the reward function is basically the same. And we can look at the kind of goals that this method proposes. So this is not the meta-learning stage. Is, these are just the goal proposals. These are uh, based on standard benchmark systems, the half cheetah and the ant. And uh, on the left, you're seeing three of the goals that were discovered via this task proposal mechanism, the diversity-driven one. So the cheetah learns to run forward, run backward, do a backflip, that sort of thing. So it's learning different skills. And the ant also learns to run in different ways. So we're getting some task proposals that look kind of reasonable. They're kind of random. They're not really doing anything in particular. But they achieve decent coverage. So next, what we can look at is the performance after we use either random or diversity-driven task proposals, then run meta-training on those tasks, 
and then take the corresponding model parameters and adapt them, in this case with gradient descent, on a new user-specified task. And the user-specified tasks here are based on the tasks used in prior meta-reinforcement learning work. So we have uh, a very simple 2D navigation task, and then we have the cheetah and the ant from the previous slide. And what you can see in these learning curves, red shows what happens if you run reinforcement learning from scratch. And that's actually the baseline to compare to because uh, we're, we don't actually have access to any previous tasks. So the, the, the best thing we can compare to is essentially what happens if you learn from scratch or what happens if you learn with some exploration. Uh, the uh, blue line shows what happens if you use the random task proposals. And the surprising thing here is that even the random task proposals actually do achieve considerable benefit on two out of the three tasks. And then the diversity-driven task proposals actually achieve benefit on all the tasks. So this is showing that even without access to any uh, user-specified tasks, you can still do meta-learning with automatic task proposals and actually get quantifiable benefit, actually do better than if you didn't have that meta-learning phase. So what about supervised learning? I talked about how we can do task proposals for, for unsupervised meta-reinforcement learning. Can we do something like that for supervised learning? Can we do it, for example, for image recognition, few-shot image recognition? So if you had large labeled image data sets, you could do meta-learning. You could also just do pre-training, and that can actually work pretty well. If you have unlabeled image data sets, then pre-training with supervised learning, of course, is not possible. So you have to use one out of a number of possible unsupervised learning methods. So what we're going to aim to do in this work is study whether we can use unsupervised meta-learning to improve over standard unsupervised learning techniques. So uh, this is work done by Kyle Sue and Chelsea Finn. And the question here is, can we meta-train on only unlabeled images? So the recipe here is going to be the following. We're going to start by running some previous unsupervised learning algorithm. And there are actually many choices here that work well. At a high level, what these methods are going to do is they're going to take your images and they're going to embed them in some space. So images become points in Rn. Then we're going to use this embedding to automatically propose tasks. And there are many different ways to propose tasks. We could do the same kind of random hyperplanes that we did in reinforcement learning. It turns out that, that actually doesn't work so well. It turns out that when proposing tasks for unsupervised meta-learning, it's actually quite important to make sure that those tasks are not too difficult. So they have to be not too easy, but also not too difficult. So what we found works well here is to actually cluster the data points after they've been embedded, but don't cluster them uh, kind of in the way so as to extract the best groups, but cluster them in an overcomplete way so you get more clusters than necessary so that many data points might fall into multiple clusters. That way, you have a lot of redundancy, and you can sample different tasks that pay attention to different aspects of the images. And then the way that you sample tasks is as following. If, if you have n classes that you want to train for, you sample n clusters. So you have, if you have two classes, you sample two clusters. Within each of those clusters, you're going to pick some data points to serve as your training set. So here, for example, class one uh, contains this image, which is going to be our training image for one-shot classification, and class two contains the image highlighted in red. And then you're going to sample another set of data points in, in, in each of the clusters to act as your test points. So those are shown here in gray. So here it turns out that class one corresponds to objects that come in pairs, and class two corresponds to objects that come in singles. OK, that seems like a reasonable task to try to solve. And then you'll do this repeatedly. Many, many times you'll sample n clusters, pick out training sets and test sets from each one, and those will be your tasks. So here, the second task we sampled appears to involve classifying round things from vertical bottle-shaped things. So that's, that's a, a category. And then we're going to do meta-learning on these task proposals. And we can do meta-learning actually using a variety of methods. We're going to test MAML. In the paper, we also test prototypical networks. And I'm sure there are also other methods that would work well here. Of course, the question now is, we're relying on this unsupervised learning phase in a very strong way. So does this procedure actually outperform unsupervised learning? Is it actually better to do unsupervised meta-learning versus just doing unsupervised learning and training a classifier on top of that? So let's try to study that question. We have a few choices for doing unsupervised learning. We actually evaluate a number of techniques in the paper. The ones I'm going to show are based on bigan and deep cluster. Uh, the method that we develop, we call it clustering to automatically construct tasks for unsupervised meta-learning, or CACTUS. Uh, and we're going to evaluate it on the mini ImageNet benchmark, which is a standard benchmark for few-shot learning, except we're not going to use the labels in the meta-training set. So the meta-training labels are simply discarded. So here's the performance for mini ImageNet on five-shot, five-way classification 
First, as a baseline, this is what happens if you run MAML with labels. So this is the, the baseline where you give it the labels on the meta trading set, it gets 62.13% accuracy. If you use BIGAN and then you do k-nearest neighbor labeling on this problem, you get 31%. So that makes sense. It's harder. It has no labels. If you do logistic regression instead of k-nearest neighbor, you get 33.9%, so it's a little better. Uh, if you train an MLP with dropout, you get 29%. And if you do this clustering and then use cluster membership as your labeling, which is a very important baseline because clustering is where we're getting our tasks, you get 29.49%. Uh, if you run unsupervised meta-learning with Cactus, on top of the same BIGAN embedding, you actually get 51.28%. So by using the same representation, simply by learning to learn on top of it, we actually uh, obtain a very large improvement in performance. If you do the same thing on top of deep cluster, you get a slight improvement at 53.97%. And the same story actually holds across three different embedding methods and four different data sets. So you can find more of the details uh, about this in the paper. So to summarize, I discussed the meta-learning problem, how we can develop a general-purpose meta-learning algorithm based on model-agnostic meta-learning, how we can handle ambiguity, and lastly, how we can begin to address this really challenging problem of automating task construction. So I'd like to thank uh, the students that were involved in this work, some of whom are pictured here. Uh, you can find uh, a lot of, uh, you can find all the publications on the lab website and also source code to many of our papers. Thank you very much. We have uh, time for some questions. Uh, thanks, Sergey, for the talk. Uh, is there any question uh, for Sergey? All right. Uh, if you have some question, you can uh, go to the mics. Some, there's like one in this row and one in that row. So when, I have two questions. The first one is uh, when you are talking about different tasks in reinforcement learning, you are only talking about the different reward function, you, or you are also talking about different dynamics as, uh, as well? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So for the purpose of the unsupervised meta reinforcement learning work, it was just different reward functions. But in general, for meta reinforcement learning, you could vary either the dynamics or the reward. Uh, I, I believe, actually, in almost all of our experiments, we mostly vary the reward function. But the basic algorithm can handle varying the dynamics as well. The second question is, don't you think that if we don't define any distribution over the test task or the mm -hmm. task comes later, uh, evaluating any of these methods is going to be a little bit yeah. difficult? That, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, and in fact, you know, one might argue that if you use a powerful enough uh, adaptation uh, mechanism, like somehow it seems to like it almost violates the no free lunch theorem. Like if you generate a random task, how could you possibly do well on test tasks? So there necessarily needs to be some structure that creeps in from the way you're proposing tasks. And I'm sure that there are t test tasks on which this method would do very poorly. So the result for now is largely empirical. Is OK, for the kind of tasks that we're defining these benchmarks, does the unsupervised procedure work? I think it's a, actually a very challenging but perhaps important question to understand in which cases will it work and which cases it won't. Unfortunately, we don't have a great answer to that yet. Thank you. Um, my question is on the original MAML algorithm. Uh, so you were mentioning you, know, you can set it up as uh, Basically, what is the best set of weights such that given one step of further training, you do the best job of matching a whole bunch of set of tasks, and you can make that four to 10? Mm -hmm. I was curious, is there any variations on a theme? So that's basically setting like the best, uh, in a convergent sense, you can do given, say, four steps. Mm -hmm. Do you ever want to formulate that a little bit differently and say, you know, what is the best, uh, you know, can I kind of weight one, two, three, and four steps mm -hmm. and sort of almost sort of shape a little bit my... Yeah. Uh, benefit of how quickly I converge, say? Uh, you can, yeah. So we've experimented with this a little bit. Uh, it doesn't seem, in our experiments, it doesn't seem to produce a really clear improvement, although it can produce an improvement in kind of a more of a continual learning setting. Uh, so we, we actually have a, a recent paper on applying this idea to online learning. And in online learning, this makes a lot of sense because you want to improve every single step. Uh, but in the classic meta-learning case, we didn't find that this uh, achieved a very large improvement. Uh, another thing that's maybe kind of in keeping with the spirit of your question is uh, there has been some work recently, not from our group, actually for, for, from other labs, studying whether instead of doing gradient descent in the inner loop, can you do something else? For example, could you use uh, a closed form least squares solver? And that's, I think, a really interesting research direction. And there's been some uh, quite, quite exciting work in that area, too. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the great talk. And then the, the whole research is very impressive. Uh, so, and the, particularly the last 
the unsupervised meta learning is quite impressive. So my question is, if we can add the weak supervision to the, this end-to-end -end process, then what do you think the most helpful for the end-to-end -end process? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, we thought about, you know, initially when we started working on this, you know, as in all research projects, nothing works in the beginning, so we were kind of disappointed. We thought, well, maybe we really need, like, semi-supervised. Maybe unsupervised meta learning is too hard. We thought about that a bit. There, are, uh, there has actually been uh, work on semi-supervised uh, meta learning, a lot of it building on ideas from prototypical networks. Uh, and I think that that's actually, in practice, might be a really interesting way to go, because you probably do have some labels, just you'd like to incorporate all the unlabeled data as well. So uh, I had a question regarding uh, language acquisition. For example, we don't know how, say, humans acquire language that well, but do you think that going through a meta-learning process, uh, we can come up with some learning procedure without really knowing how humans do it, but just surpass it without really knowing how humans do it, like just yeah. a parallel track of... Yeah, yeah I, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, that's a very difficult question to answer. I... I think the best answer I can give is maybe. I mean, it seems pretty clear that if you set up an optimization problem and you can solve that optimization problem, you'll get something that, that, that maximizes your objective. If it's the right objective, you'll do well. So if, in principle, meta-learning, as it was formulated in this talk, is a well-defined optimization problem. So if you solve it, you should do well, which means that you should be able to acquire a learning procedure that does well. In practice, there are a bunch of factors that come into play. For example, if we're learning a learning algorithm, we'd like to deploy that learning algorithm in many different settings. So the bar for generalization seems to be extremely high. Uh, so I actually am very enthusiastic about the, the idea of methods like MAML that actually learn to learn, but also retain some of the structure of learning algorithms, that they, they can be formulated as conversion optimization procedures. And that seems like, because there's something very fundamental about a conversion optimization procedure. It's not just some, uh, you know, piece of knowledge about the world. It's actually a very fundamental mathematical thing. But the real answer is I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, on that note, uh, that was the last talk of this edition of uh, Bellern. Thank you very much, Sergey.